So what are the goals for this class? Well, we already looked at what your goals are. Here's what I would put down as goals. I want you to develop an understanding of basic crystallographic concepts. We are not going to go into all the exceptions in this class. We'll do the basics. So, if you ever need to solve a structure yourself, those should be useful, okay? You should be able to look at a crystallographic publication and you can interpret what is in there. Okay? That goes back to understanding talks also. What you can ask then is, what do the data mean? Do the data make sense? This is something that you may be wondering, why on earth would anybody ask that? We are very used to saying whatever is out in the open literature is the truth. It's not always the case. And especially with the current situation where there are more users of crystallography than people who have actually been properly taught, you may find publications with crystal data that may not make sense in every single aspect. You need to be able to judge that. The last part that would be a goal is I want you to appreciate what are the steps that are involved in a crystal structure solution. Now this once again ties back into the second one, okay? Do things make sense? Is this interpre interpretation correct? If you know what the steps were that got people to that point, you can probably see whether or not there was a place where they might have made a mistake, okay? So that is useful for reading data. It's also useful if you ever have what is called a non-standard problem. Standard problems, sometimes all you have to do is push a button and you'll get to the solution. Well, that's great. It doesn't always work. So what do you do if pushing the button doesn't lead you to the solution? Do you just say, ah oh, well, throw out the crystal, synthesize something else? No. You'll try a bit more, okay? You'll try to interact with that black box and actually get the black box to give you a solution. But for that, you need some knowledge to know where to tweak it. So, what is crystallography and why are we doing it? Crystallography is the determination of the atomic structure of a crystalline solid. That's a mouthful. What it means is we can locate where the atoms are, we can say what the type of the atom is, and of course if we can do that for every single atom, then we can also look at bond distances, at the local environment, what the structure looks like. One big thing for crystallography is we can actually determine absolute structure. No other method can easily and directly determine absolute structure. You can play some tricks with NMR in some cases, but crystallography directly gives you the absolute structure. It's very powerful in a world of chiral materials. Why do we do crystallography? Well, usually materials properties depend on their atomic level structure. That's why we do crystallography. We need to know the atomic level structure to really understand properties. And this holds true for inorganic, organic and biomolecules. Okay? Piezoelectrics, the structure is what dictates the fact that they have these properties. Organic molecules, they're used as drugs. Their structure dictates that they can bind to certain receptors. Think about biochemistry, enzymes, active sites in enzymes. You need to know what it looks like so that you can actually design an inhibitor or an activator or whatever you want to design, okay? So, structural analysis is very important and people have more and more realized how important this is over the past decades and that is why there has been so much effort put into developing new instrumentation and driving this field forward. How can you really judge what an impact crystallography has had? Well, there are a large number of Nobel Prizes that are related to crystallography work. Okay? What were the first ones? Well, the first people who were involved in what we nowadays call crystallography all got Nobel Prizes. First one was Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen, who discovered X-rays back in 1895, so 113 years ago. What did he do? Was he looking for X-rays? No. He was doing some completely different experiments. He was working on UV radiation. 
And so to do some experiments, he darkened the room so he could see more appropriately. He covered his cathode ray discharge tube. That was kind of the first precursor to today's X-ray tubes. With some paper. And all of a sudden, he saw a fluorescent screen several feet away light up. So he figured there had to be some radiation that caused that. And rumor has it, he locked himself in his lab for about two weeks, trying to figure out what this is. And he called these rays X-rays, the unknown rays. Okay. There are some countries that don't call them X-rays. Germany actually decided to call them Röntgen rays in honor of Röntgen. And Röntgen was actually born, um, well, not born, yeah, he was born in a small German town called Remscheid. And I never knew much about that. I actually lived in that town for 19 years of my life, in the neighboring town. So I could have biked there to the place where he was born. This is a postcard of his birth house. I never knew that until I left for the United States and started learning about x-rays. So it's kind of a waste. I lived close to where Röntgen was born, where the Röntgen Museum is, and I actually never got to go there because I had moved away before I figured it out. He was certainly somebody who got a Nobel Prize related to crystallography, as you can imagine. Now, it took almost another 20 years before people could really make use of x-rays. It was 1912-1913, which was the birth of what we would nowadays call crystallography. Okay? 1912, the German scientist Max von Lauer discovered that crystals will diffract x-rays. What he used was a copper, sul copper sulfide crystal. He put a piece of film behind it and he got diffraction spots. The Braggs, father and son, so William Henry and William Lawrence, were the ones that actually did some more experiments and tried to put some math behind this too. So they formulated what is nowadays famous and called the Bragg Law. A lot of you might have heard it in physics because it's also used for slit experiments, things like that. This is one of the base laws of X-ray diffraction. And you'll see it again a few lectures down the road. Now I promise you there were a lot of Nobel Prizes related to crystallography. This is the list. And as a matter of fact, I'm bad. I did not update it. There are some in the 2000s that I should have added to that list. But the print is already small enough as is. Okay. Are there names on there that you'll, dis uh, that you'll recognize? We start with Röntgen, von Lauer and Bragg. So we certainly know those. There are some on there that you would probably not have put on the list of crystallography. For example, Peter Dubai. First thing that comes to most people's line, uh, mind when they hear Dubai, it's not crystallography, right? But he got his Nobel Prize for his contributions to how you can determine molecular structure as a matter of, faction, uh, uh, of fact. He used the fraction of x-rays and electrons in gases. So he didn't do what most people do, which is work with ordered solids, okay? So there are some non-standard things on here. Linus Pauling is another one that you would probably not have associated with crystallography. A lot of these people were involved in some kind of crystallography during their life. And you can certainly look back at this and see what their contributions were. So those were the beginnings of crystallography. What can you do today? Well, one of the most popular areas of crystallography is small molecule structure determination. And that has almost become a routine task nowadays. If you have a good crystal, you know its stoichiometry. In some cases, you put it on, the program suggests to you how you should collect the data. You say, OK. You then take the data and you just hit OK on every single step of the data processing and you'll get a structure. That's pretty powerful. Now, 50 years ago, that would not have held true. People didn't have the same computers as nowadays. Some of the methods that we are routinely using nowadays were not known back then. At that time it was a lot of work, a lot of manual work. And if you solve the structure of one or two crystals, that was your PhD thesis, right there, okay? Don't run that lucky nowadays, at least not with small molecules. 
macromolecules you may still stand a shot okay nowadays collecting a data set usually takes less than a day In many cases 6 to 12 hours if you have really weakly scattering crystal maybe it takes 24 in the old days it took a few weeks part of that is that we have better detectors nowadays we'll be talking about all of these advances as we proceed with the class another big one and several of you might be interested in this in the future is you can determine the structure of macromolecules from single crystal data now for you that seems to be something that is a little more challenging but almost normal okay if you had told people 20 30 years ago that the atomic level structure of macromolecules would be determined from diffraction data a lot of people would have laughed at you same way some cases you can determine structures from powder data when the first attempts at this were made back in the 1980s reviewers laughed at the people who submitted these papers and said they don't know what they are talking about well it took a while to establish this but indeed it is possible it's not trivial this is certainly an area where you would need to know some crystallography if you ever wanted to attempt it okay another big advance is synchrotron radiation and we'll have a specialized lecture devoted to synchrotrons and neutron sources gives you a lot more power for small molecules you can sometimes use extremely small crystals that other people would call a powder 10 micron not that small at a synchrotron I think one of the record holders is actually people solved a single crystal data set from a crystal that was about a micron on each edge that is a pretty nice fine powder for most people I've never pushed it to one micron I have actually collected single crystal data at the Cornell synchrotron on a crystal that was about seven or eight micron on edge diffracted quite nicely at a synchrotron you couldn't put it on a lab source and expect that okay you just don't have enough x-rays in the lab so let's take a step back from crystallography let's ask the question of how do we actually determine structure at all I just told you x-rays were discovered in 1895 right do you find some kind of information about structure in the literature before 1895 what do you think yes or no good question right most of us don't read that literature as a matter of fact there were people who called themselves probably crystallographers way before 1895 we would probably call them mineralogists nowadays okay what do mineralogists do they look at minerals all right and they actually describe the minerals that they found for that matter those are often crystals okay and that is why in some of the older papers they would consider themselves crystallographers because they work with crystals yeah, salt, salt for example yeah the atomic level structure of salt wasn't determined until after the Brax had actually found their Brax law okay but people knew something about what kind of components are in there they also knew that you often have cube shaped salt crystals okay so they established something they called the cubic crystal system they had no clue of crystallography as we know it nowadays but they could look at a nice big crystal and say it looks like a cube I call it cubic they also assigned all the other names of crystal systems that we will be learning in the next lecture okay because the external shape of crystals actually allowed them to describe these crystals okay so they didn't know anything about the atomic scale structure but they did know something about the outside structure and what they found was that certain minerals tended to grow in the same shapes it wasn't that you found all kinds of different shapes they usually had the same type of shape every time you found it so that was the really old days of crystallography of course crystallography isn't the only tool that people are using in organic chemistry the first thing that people will turn to is probably NMR okay organic chemists without NMR 
is a lost chemist. Okay. What are the advantages for NMR? Well, it's a very powerful structural tool. You can certainly get a lot of information out of it. It's pretty fast. You can use it on materials in solution. You can use it on amorphous materials. And it's great if you're working with carbon or hydrogen. How about you work with NaCl? Who wants to do NMR on NaCl? Probably not as easy, right? And NaCl is still a fairly trivial material. A lot of non-standard nuclei are either not feasible for NMR at all or they are very difficult. Okay? Of course, NMR also works better in solution than it does in the solid state. It's more difficult. So, at that place where NMR often runs into problems is where crystallography often succeeds. Crystallographic methods as we know them nowadays give you a detailed time average picture. Now remember it's time averaged. Okay. Three dimensional. The downfall is most of what we will be talking about in this class only works on crystalline materials. It does not work on amorphous materials. It does not work on glasses. A lot of it does not work well on solutions. So you do need a crystalline material. What are other methods that could be useful? Another popular one is electron microscopy. Okay? It's a very powerful tool to just look at particles. And for high resolution electron microscopy you can actually look at lattices. You can't really see each individual atom, but you can kind of see rows of atoms. So you can get some idea of atomic arrangements from high resolution electron microscopy. What do you do there? You shoot high energy electrons at your sample, you focus them with magnetic lenses, and you get your picture from that. Okay? It's a two-dimensional image. So that could be a problem if you look at three-dimensional structures. The other thing is, especially if you work with biological samples, most of them aren't too happy about being shot with 400 kV electrons. They might actually disintegrate right in front of your eyes. So you could damage your sample. You also have a limitation in how thick your sample can be. Electron beams only penetrate so far. And of course, you need to actually interpret that image. You need to do a lot of modeling trying to figure out what this one is. So it is not as straightforward as small molecule crystallography. So how do you actually choose what kind of a tool you use for your specific problem in structural analysis? What it boils down to is to pick the appropriate probe. Okay? This gives you the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. What we have here are, you know, microwaves, TV waves, infrared, which most of us know, visible, which all of us know, right? Visible light, UV light, and then we go into the X-ray and gamma ray region. So as you can see, these all share something in common. They're electromagnetic radiation. Now, all of us are used to light scattering, right? Because we use light scattering every day just looking around this room. This can give us some information on the length scale of light. Well, first of all, we can see things that are bigger, right? And, of course, anybody who has ever done any experiments with gratings knows that light will diffract. Or if you have ever seen a prism that splits the light into the different colors. So, things that are on about the same length scale as light can be imaged in some kind of way with light mic microscopy, okay? We can also do particle size distribution measurements with what is called dynamic light scattering. And you may meet that one again in some talks that you'll hear during the semester in seminars. That is usually particles that are on the nanometer scale. And what is the wavelength of light? Well, nanometers, right? 100 nanometers. So once again, it's about the same length scale. What we want to look at in X-ray crystallography is ordering at the, atomic um, at the atomic length scale. Now, what are typical interatomic distances? Any idea? Between 
between 1 and 10 angstroms. Actually, if it is a direct bond, it's probably shorter than 10. 10 would be more interactions through space. Pretty typical in biology, actually. 1 to about 3, 3.5 three angstroms is probably the typical bond distances that we are looking at. Okay, so very good guess. That wavelength on the electromagnetic spectrum happens to be the X-ray region. So that is why we use X-rays to investigate atomic level structure. Okay. Now, there's one big challenge though. If we wanted to do some type of microscopy or something similar, how do we focus X-rays? Light we know how to focus, right? We put some pieces of glass in there that are somehow processed beforehand and we can focus our light beam. How do you focus X-rays? Good question, right? What light focusing is based on is the fact that the refractive index of light is very different in different materials, right? That is why glass will actually focus our light. And here's a little picture of how a light microscope works. You focus the light, you look at it. Pretty trivial. You use lenses. Can't do that with x-rays. The reason for that is that the refractive index of x-rays in all materials is almost identical. For purposes of remembering, the refractive x-ray index is close to 1 in all materials. If you want it more precisely, varies between about 0.99 and 0.999. Not a big difference. You would need some pretty darn big microscopes to make use of the biggest difference in x-ray index. Okay in X-ray refractive index. So that's not feasible. So what we have to do is use different types of focusing. And there are actually two methods that are commonly used. The first one is to actually use diffraction-based optics. We'll be talking more about diffraction in the future. But what it is is diffraction splits X-rays into different peaks. That was what Max von Lauer did. He put a crystal in the beam. He got peaks of X-rays. What you can do is use one of those peaks as your x-ray source, right? That way, instead of having the x-rays go everywhere, you have this one nice narrow peak as your source. Of course, it also means that you don't get all of the x-ray intensity from your source, but it gives you a very good sharp focus. The second option is that you can actually use so-called x-ray mirrors. Certain metals, when you go to very low angles, will actually completely reflect the x-rays. It's called grazing in incidence. It's usually below half a degree. What is commonly used is, for example, platinum, but there are other materials that are also used. And what happens is that the x-rays will completely bounce off. Now, if you basically have a focal array of mirrors, then they will kind of bounce back and forth, and you'll get a fairly narrowly focused x-ray beam. So that is actually a very commonly used method in lab instruments, that you use some kind of an x-ray mirror to focus these things. Unless you choose to just throw out some of your x-rays and only live with the ones that go in the right direction. Now, we've been talking about these x-rays. One of the questions that you may ask yourself is, how do you make x-rays, right? Because we've all probably encountered x-rays at some point in time. Certainly, if we ever had to go to the hospital to figure out whether our bones were still in one piece. Or at the dentist. So we all know that x-rays exist, but how do you make them? This is a picture of an x-ray cathode. And it's a little simplified, but it gives you all the major components. Here are the x-rays, okay? So we are producing them in this thing. How do you make them? You actually have a filament. In most cases it's a tungsten filament. What you do is you put some current through that filament. So that's not so different from an ordinary light bulb, right? The big difference is that you then apply a high voltage difference between your target here and that filament. What happens if you apply a high voltage difference to a wire that has electrons flowing in it? 
the electrons start flying exactly they come out of that wire and they start flying and as they are accelerated in this direction they will hit this little piece which is a metal target now we have some pretty high energy electrons they hit that target they basically mess with the atoms in that target and that is what creates the x-rays when you hit this target We'll talk about that in more detail once again in one of the next lectures. So this is where the X-ray emission happens. Of course this whole thing has to be under vacuum because if it wasn't under vacuum, those electrons would never make it to the target. They would just hit air molecules and be gone. That's why we have glass on the top just to seal it off. The other thing that happens is this target will get pretty hot. So in order to keep it from melting, because at least in this case it's a copper target, we apply some cooling water. Okay? The other reason why you cool things is, in many cases you have some kind of lead shielding around when there are x-rays around. You might know that from the hospital or from the dentist, because they make you put on some lead vests, right? So that you don't get exposed to x-rays where you don't want to get exposed. Lead actually has a very low melting point, about 330 centigrade. It would be pretty easy to heat this tube to the point where the lead around starts to soften. So that's why you apply cooling water whenever you produce x-rays. So, now that we know how we make x-rays, how do you set up a diffraction experiment? Here's a very simplistic picture. We'll learn more about all the details in the setup in the future. Single crystal and powder experiment. What do we have in both cases? We have an x-ray source. Okay. In this case we have the x-ray source here. We have some kind of optics that focus that beam. I call it a collimator. Over there we have a source and we have some slits. Same kind of concept. Okay. Something that focuses it. Then we put the sample that we want to diffract off somewhere in the beam. In this case, it's a single crystal. In this case, it is a powder sample because this is a powder diffractometer. And then we put something behind our sample that can help us detect what comes off the sample. This is a very old setup, okay? You simply have a source, a crystal, and a piece of photographic film behind it. What you can see there is, you get spots on the film. What you find over here is that you have a detector and also what you might see here is, you have some drawing with angles there, right? We'll get a lot, in a lot more detail into these drawings and these angles, but what you can see at the powder instrument is that you will always have to move something in order to actually get your data. And that is why you have that angular scale there. Things will be moving on that angular scale. Single crystal experiment, in most cases we move things too. However, the very oldest methods actually did not move anything. So that is why crystallography really started with this kind of setup. It was the easiest setup to do. There was nothing difficult mechanically. You needed a source, something to focus the beam, a crystal and a piece of film. Pretty straightforward. So that's a brief introduction to crystallography. As I said, not much meat in here yet. We'll get into a lot more meat in the future. Any questions at this point in time? Uh, when you were talking about the uh, actual uh, focusing the x-rays, mm -hmm. and you said um, you have to like, increase the angle part of that will actually reflect off the surfaces. Actually decrease. It has to be a small angle. So is that to overcome like, the work function of the metal? The main thing is that if you have a higher angle, you would get into normal diffraction or you would get into absorption. So what you want to do is go at a small enough angle that you have total reflection. It's kind of similar to light. You might know it from light that when you go below a certain angle, you have total reflection. So the same happens with the x-rays. We call it grazing incidence. At certain angles, you reflect the x-rays. Does that make more sense? Yeah. Other questions? Alright, if not, then I suggest that we actually 
wrap things up up here and do a quick tour of the x-ray instruments in the instrumentation center so that you can actually see all the things that are related to what we talk about in this class.